I'd also like to thank our event sponsors today, including Brown and Caldwell. Brown and Caldwell, safeguarding water, maintaining infrastructure, and restoring habitats to keep communities thriving. That's their purpose and passion. We'd also like to thank GHD. GHD providing global sustainable water solutions covering every stage of the natural and managed water cycle. Thank you to our sponsors. At this time, I'd like to introduce Heather Cooley, our moderator for today's webinar. Heather is the Director of Research for Pacific Institute, overseeing research on an array of issues such as sustainable water use and management, connections between water and energy, and the impacts of climate change on water resources. Please give Heather a big welcome in, in the chat. And Heather, over to you. Thank you, Alec. Hello, and welcome to the Brave Blue World virtual screening and panel discussion. Um, let's start by welcoming our five panelists today. Uh, first, we have Michelle Hummel. Uh, she's Associate Professor of Water Resources at University of Texas at Arlington. Uh, she specializes in the development of numerical models to simulate flood hazards driven by extreme vents and long-term sea level rise. We also have Jennifer West. Uh, Jennifer West is Managing Director of Water Reuse California, which is the leading organization in California promoting the safe, practical, and beneficial use of recycled water. We also have Chris Hyun, is a senior environmental scientist and climate specialist at the State Water Resources Control Board, where he serves as staff lead on supporting and implementing climate-related directives across the board's divisions and offices. We have Bryn Weeks, who is an environmental engineer and water re reuse technologist uh, from Corolo Engineers, where she specializes in potable and non-potable water reuse projects. And we have Eileen White. Uh, Eileen White is Director of Wastewater at East Bay Municipal Utilities District, where she plans, organizes, and leads the engineering, operations, and maintenance of the wastewater system. Thank you everyone for participating on the panel. Um, I'd also like to thank Alec Mackey of the California Water Environment Association, who's co-hosting this event uh, and was instrumental in organizing it. And also to Rebecca Olson, she's communications manager at the Pacific Institute and also uh, helped to organize the event. So thank you again to panelists and to Alec uh, and to Rebecca as well. Uh, Brave Blue World was released uh, in 2020. And if you haven't already watched it, I would re recommend doing so. Um, it describes how innovation and technology uh, can address some of our water challenges and help realize sustainability and increasingly resilience. Um, it features, of course, some well-known actors in Hollywood, uh, Matt Damon, Jaden Smith, and Liam Neeson, um, but also some of the world's leading water experts and some incredible entrepreneurs who are working every day to develop appropriate solutions in communities around the world. One of the things I appreciated most about the film was its emphasis on solutions um, and in so doing providing a message of hope and optimism. It's my hope we can channel that in our discussion today as we discuss climate risks and opportunities for wastewater systems. Um, from rising seas to increasingly severe floods and droughts, wastewater systems are facing an era of unprecedented and growing uncertainty. Wastewater systems are especially vulnerable, but they also hold tremendous promise for advancing water resi resilience through, for example, water reuse and energy recovery. Uh, just as a reminder, if you have any questions for our panelists, please add those uh, in the Q&A. Uh, but before we get to our audience questions, I have a few questions for each of our panelists. So let's start with Michelle Hummel. Michelle, you led a national study on the impacts of sea level rise on wastewater treatment plants. Can you describe what you found in that study? Sure, can you hear me okay, Heather? Yes. Okay, great. So for our study, uh, we were quantifying the potential for overland flooding due to sea level rise anywhere from one foot to six feet at wastewater treatment plants across the coastal US. And in addition to that, we also calculated the number of people who are served by those affected wastewater treatment plants in order to get a sense of the broader implications of flooding at these sites. So overall, we found that nearly 400 wastewater treatment plants that serve almost 32 million people are at risk across the US. 
And the states with the highest risk include New York and New Jersey in the Northeast, uh, primarily Florida, Louisiana, and Texas in the South, and then California also has a lot of risk. And of particular note in California, even with just one foot of sea level rise, over 1 million residents could experience disruptions to their wastewater service. And with six feet of sea level rise, which is the highest level that we analyzed, that number would be closer to 5.5 million people. And so given this higher exposure in California, we also looked more specifically at the San Francisco Bay Area, where a lot of the California vulnerability is centered um, because of the 36 wastewater treatment plants in California that are potentially vulnerable to sea level rise, 30 of those are located around San Francisco Bay. Um, so for this analysis, we considered overland flooding as we did with the national analysis, but we also looked at groundwater flooding as well because sea level rise uh, will also lead to higher groundwater levels in coastal aquifers. And we wanted to make sure to capture the potential impacts of that potential source of flooding as well. Uh, so we found that many of those 30 wastewater treatment plants that are susceptible to marine flooding are also vulnerable to groundwater flooding. And in some cases, groundwater flooding could occur before marine flooding or impact plants that are not affected by marine flooding. So it's really important to consider both sources of flooding over land and groundwater uh, when developing adaptation strategies for wastewater infrastructure. Great. Thank, yeah, one of the things I, I really like the, the groundwater piece, I feel like that's been one of the topics that hasn't quite um, been addressed as much uh, as, as the marine flooding. So I was really excited to see that. So thank you for doing that. Um, wh why should we care about, about this? What, what are some of the risks of marine flooding and of groundwater flooding of, of these wastewater treatment plants? Sure. So flooding can pose a number of different risks to wastewater infrastructure. Our study was focused on the treatment plants themselves um, and at those plants, even before flooding occurs, higher sea levels can interfere with existing outfall structures for treated effluent and underwater discharges as well. And so those outfalls may need to be modified um, or you know, larger pumps may need to be installed to overcome the increase in pressure at those outfall locations. Uh, then as we start to see um, intermittent or potentially permanent flooding due to sea level rise that could overwhelm tanks and pipes at the plants as well as disrupt electrical systems. Um, and the combination of those effects could um, interfere with the treatment process and lead to discharge of untreated effluent to the coastal zone. Um, and particularly as we are talking about coastal flooding, the salinity of marine water also poses an additional risk um, as it leads to potential for corrosion of critical plant components as well. Uh, so there are a lot of potential um, risks due to flooding and you know, we wanna try to think about adaptation strategies that can hopefully address multiple risks. Great, and, and speaking of adaptation, what, what are some of the things that can be implemented and are there some uh, you know, how do we deal with the marine flooding, groundwater flooding? Are there some that might exacerbate some of those? Or maybe you could speak, speak to that as well. Yeah, so a lot of, um, you know, the potential adaptation strategies that could be considered for wastewater facilities can sort of be divided into protective strategies or uh, relocation. And so these protective approaches, they can take the form of gray infrastructure like seawalls and levees, which is more engineered, or potentially more hybrid approaches that include a combination of engineered and natural features, um, such as a restored marsh, for example. And the goal of these protective strategies is to provide a barrier at the shoreline that prevents overland flooding. However, these strategies may not be effective against groundwater flooding as they typically don't have uh, deep enough foundations or impermeable foundations that would allow them to disconnect the groundwater aquifer from the coastal influence. And so even with these structures in place, you can still see higher groundwater levels. Um, and that could also exacerbate the effects of groundwater flooding by trapping the emergent subsurface water from uh, on the landward side of these structures and preventing it from draining to the bay. And so then, you know, you might need additional pumping in those areas to keep the infrastructure dry behind the levees um, as groundwater levels continue to rise. So that's um, an important consideration there. 
Relocation, on the other hand, is likely to provide the greatest reduction in flood exposure in the long term um, because it can address both the overland flooding as you move the structure away from the influence of waves and storm surge, as well as groundwater um, flooding. So if we move it further inland to areas where um, the water table is not as high, that can also address that source of flooding as well. Um, but of course, there are also challenges to relocation in terms of finding and permitting appropriate sites, and then the cost of um, rebuilding the infrastructure. So it's really sort of a balancing act between, um, you know, what are the current risks at the plant? What does the timeline of risk look like? And how do we want to invest in either adaptation in place through prote protective um, strategies or relocation strategies that might perhaps provide longer term benefits? Great. Well, thank you so much. Again, really appreciate the work and, and hopefully we'll have some more uh, questions around, particularly around these adaptation strategies. Sounds good. Thank you. So Jennifer, um, uh, in July of 2020, uh, Governor Newsom released a final version of the water resilience uh, portfolio and in it recycled water was identified as a priority strategy and there were several recommendations to support recycled water. Um, what do you see as the relationship between recycled water and, and resilience? How, how can recycled water help our communities uh, adapt to climate change and other stresses? Thank you. And thank you, Heather, for, for having me on this panel. It's a real treat. Um, as we look at the, uh, the portfolio um, and how recycled water was, in fact, highlighted in the governor's water resilience portfolio, I think because recycled water has the ability to um, diversify supplies, and that is incredibly an important uh, adaptation strategy as we face climate change in this state. So we're not going to be able to de depend on the snowpack as it has existed. Moving forward, we're looking at the reduction of the snowpack, a lot of our traditional sources of supplies under severe stress. So we really need to reimagine our water supply in California and think of ways to um, using that um, additional diversification of supply. So I see recycled water in all of its forms as uh, important elements of this diversification and adapting to climate change. And as we talk about all of its forms, recycled water includes recycled water for commercial and industrial purposes, um, for landscape irrigation, for agricultural irrigation, and now we've really seen it take off for drinking water supply purposes, um, the highly purified um, uh, recycled water known as potable reuse. Great. Can, can you speak a little bit to how widely water reuse is practiced in California and, and how is that changing? Is it, is it new? Uh, is it something communities have been doing? Maybe you could speak to that for us. Well, it's almost been a hundred years since the water board, or actually it wasn't called the water board then, but I think it was the water commission adopted regulations for recycled water. So it actually started um, in San Francisco. Um, in the background here, you can see that it was used, I think first in Golden Gate Park was one of the first uses. And those regulations were in place. And then um, we saw the rise of uh, recycled water for agricultural uses. And that was, um, and we saw that then being uh, supported and including the, the other types of uses that I listed. Um, in terms of potable reuse using like, again, purified uh, recycled water, that was um, started in California actually in 1960, in the 1960s of the Montebello Floor Bay. Um, but more recently we've seen the Orange County Water District really expand this practice and now we're seeing agencies throughout California along the coast in particular, um, really seeking out potable reuse supplies for drinking water purposes. We're seeing the state water board uh, help us in those efforts by coming up with a variety of regulations that are specific to the types of potable reuse used, whether it's for groundwater, for whether it's for recycled water, purified water going into the groundwater or into a reservoir. Mm -hmm. And now more recently talking about it having, having a um, going into um, uh, directly into the water system. Great. And so what do you what do you feel like could be done to support water reuse in California? And, and what, what does success look like? Well, great question. Um, 
So all of these projects, as I mentioned, need a regulatory framework. And so we're the Water Board is the regulatory agency in California responsible for making sure we have statewide regulations for all these activities. And so um, I would say that they need to complete their regulations for what we call direct potable reuse and they're, they're well underway. We actually had legislation requiring that they complete this by 2023, but there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, they also need to finalize and update some other regulations that they had for landscape irrigation, regulations that will make it easier and more streamlined to use recycled water inside buildings um, and so forth. So there's a variety of regulations they need to do those updates. Um, but most importantly, um, we need funding for these purposes. And one of the things we're working on with Water Reuse California is a climate action bond that's currently before the legislature. Um, these, these are incredibly complicated, uh, especially the potable reuse projects are incredibly complicated, involved projects. Um, and there is a great deal of need. We did a survey in 2019 identifying almost $13 billion of planned recycled water projects in California. Um, uh, so we have uh, low interest loan needs and grant and needs for grants. So as we're looking at that climate bond, which potentially could be on the ballot in 2022, we, we're seeking $1.5 billion for that, for that investment. As I said, a major investment, a bold investment, but we really need to kind of um, reimagine our water supply and we think this will help us. Great, thank you. And hopefully as the discussions at the federal level, I think uh, play out, there might be some opportunities there as well, obviously. I hope so. Thanks, Jennifer. Thank um, Chris, tur turning to you. So as a reminder, Chris, Chris is a um, environment or senior environmental scientist with the State Water Board. Um, and in 2019, the State Water Board released an assessment uh, of co-digestion capacity at municipal wastewater treatment plants. Uh, before we get into some of the findings of that assessment, can you just briefly touch on sort of what co-digestion is and and then uh, what sort of motivated that, that uh, assessment? Sure, thank you, Heather. Um, uh, a simple definition of co-digestion is the process of breaking down food waste and wastewater sludge together. And so the co-digestion report specifically focuses on co-digestion through anaerobic digestion within wastewater treatment plants across California. So anaerobic digestion is important because of California's Senate Bill 1383, which kind of drives the whole study, the whole report. And so uh, SB 1383 aims to reduce short-lived climate pollutants across California, uh, in particular, it targets a 40% reduction of methane, which is a powerful greenhouse gas by 2030. So the bill focuses on food waste uh, to make these reductions. Approximately 20% of methane emissions result from decomposition of organic waste in landfills. And almost a third of the organic waste um, uh, disposed in landfills is food waste. So the bill targets a 75% reduction of statewide organic uh, waste disposal by 2025. And there are, it proposes three strategies to do that, um, to divert the waste, uh, food recovery, composting, and anaerobic digestion. So this brings us back to the motivation of the study. We know that a number of wastewater treatment plants already have anaerobic digestion. So driven by greenhouse gas reductions, a pending and an impending increase of food waste supply due to the bill, um, we were questioning what capacity do California wastewater treatment plants have to process this incoming food waste um, supply. Great. And what did you find was the capacity for co-digestion um, at municipal treatment plants in California? So a lot of the study uh, focuses on seven plants that currently or have planned uh, by 2025 uh, food waste receiving st stations and all the co-digestion system components. So there's the anaerobic digester, which a lot of plants already have, but there are other components like for biosolids dewatering and biogas system, and also the food receiving station. And so currently uh, of the seven plants, they uh, have the capacity to account for about less than 5% of the projected food waste. 
but the seven uh, plants have extra capacity for their anaerobic digestion. So this is already a kind of existing anaerobic digestion capacity, which isn't being used. So if there was a build out of the other components like biogas system, like a biogas system, food receiving station, and uh, biosolids dewatering, uh, mm -hmm. then there could be up to 70% uh, of the projected food waste to, uh, could, could be accounted for, possibly even more. Great. Right. And, and what uh, you'd mentioned at the outset, sort of greenhouse gas uh, emission reductions. And so to what extent, and I know this is one of the things you, you evaluated, to what extent could co-digestion help to reach some of those statewide emission reduction, greenhouse gas emission reduction goals? Yeah, just overall, again, if we build out that digest, from the digester capacity, um, uh, and consider the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, uh, especially when you add in the kind of beneficial use, including compost and uh, biogas uh, beneficial use, then there could be a reduction of about 1.5 to 2.4 uh, million tons of CO2 equivalent per year. So this is reaching up to the 4 million uh, tons of CO2 equivalent goal that we have as a state uh, by 2030. So there are a number of calculations in there, but that's kind of the estimated cost statewide. Um, and so that's kind of looking out at a statewide, very general uh, build out uh, for co-digestion. Great. Uh, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, yeah, more questions that will definitely circle back, I'm sure. Um, and then uh, one of the elements of the report was looking at the costs and benefits of co-digestion. So could, could you sort of speak to what you found in the report? You know, do these types of investments really pencil out? Again, this, the report looked statewide, very generally. Uh, and there was an estimate net benefit uh, uh, the, overall in terms of capital investments. So they were looking at a net benefit of about 180 to two, uh, $255 million per year. Um, and that includes a cost, uh, an original capital investment of around 9 million to 1.4 billion statewide. So there is an overall net benefit according to the study, but it all depends on the individual plant. It could be a different story. The study did see that larger plants did benefit more than smaller plants. Um, and so that all has to be taken care, uh, taken into consideration. Also, it included revenue from carbon credits. And so we know that those carbon credit rates change over time. And so that needs to be uh, considered as well. Right. And, the, and so the, the revenue side included, as you mentioned, carbon credits, but then there was sort of avoided energy costs, um, potentially tipping fees, right, for those mm -hmm. that are looking to distribute. I, what, what else? Am I missing any there? Or is that uh, the energy uh, uh, electricity produced, right. um, sales of uh, renewable natural gas. Um, those are the main ones. Okay. Yeah. But again, they're going to vary from from facility to facility. So I, yes. I have a and little... from time to time, over time as well. Right, right. Good point. I imagine some of that will come up in the discussion too, particularly maybe when we talk to Eileen White from East Bay Mud. Yes. But thank you. Um, and then what what's next? Obviously, this this report was an important component of sort of the state board board's effort. But but what what what's happening now? So the study uh, the report was finalized in 2019. So uh, the report is labeled as 2019, but it was released by Cal EPA in August of last year, 2020. And since then, there was there's been a rollout. So we've hosted, uh, we've had workshops, uh, one with the California Water Environmental Association, and other presentations about the report. Uh, and now we're meeting with key stakeholders in order to have stakeholder informed recommendations to Cal EPA about moving co-digestion forward. So in December, 2020, we had an in industry uh, stakeholder meeting and had discussions and collected comments from there. In April, we're going to have a meeting with environmental justice uh, leaders from key organizations uh, so we can collect their comments. And so we're still in the process of um, 
considering recommendations for the future. Um, we didn't expect, of course, the pandemic to make huge shifts in our plans. And so we're trying to figure that out. And we are also looking toward a, uh, a drought this year. So we're trying to shuffle these priorities um, and seeing how we can advance co-digestion with these stakeholder informed recommendations. Great, thank you. I really appreciate, appreciate that, Chris. So uh, switching and talking, talking to Bryn, uh, Bryn Weeks of Corolla Engineers. Um, Bryn has been working uh, on the relocation of the Morro Bay wastewater treatment plant. Uh, we talked to Michelle earlier. Uh, she had mentioned that this is sort of one strategy for dealing uh, with sea level rise. Uh, so Bryn, can you describe a bit about what prompted the relocation of the wastewater treatment plan and, and the key elements of the project? Sure, yeah. So for those of you who don't know, um, Morro Bay is a pretty small community. It's about 10,000 people. Um, it's located along the central coast, um, about halfway between San Francisco and California. I mean, sorry, San Francisco and Los Angeles. Um, and uh, Morro Bay story, didn't, it didn't really start with let's move the wastewater treatment facility. It really was trying to solve uh, two problems simultaneously. There was a wastewater discharge problem. Um, and then there was a water supply problem. So the existing wastewater treatment facility is located right on a beach. Uh, it's a beautiful place to go to work. It's also in a tsunami zone. Um, and the existing process is um, a trickling filter process. And so that process um, is not sized to handle the um, their weekend. You know, they have large weekend holidays where the whole town gets inundated with people and um, the facility isn't quite handle, uh, sized to handle those flows. It's also not sized to handle the um, wet weather flows. So basically in the early 2000s, uh, Morro Bay with the neighboring community Cayucas, which also shares this treatment facility, they started planning for upgrades to the wastewater treatment plant. They said, okay, we need to expand this thing. Let's start planning for it. Then they applied for a coastal, commis uh, coastal commission permit um, because they're located on a beach, they have to get, and you know, anything that happens on the beach has to get a, a California Coastal Commission permit. And basically the Coastal Commission said, you know, we're not gonna approve this. We're not, we're not gonna uh, endorse any um, upgrades to this facility that's basically in this uh, flood prone area. Um, so then they said, okay, it became apparent to the city, okay, we're going to have to completely relocate this uh, facility inland. And uh, they did, they found a location, it's about three miles on the other side of town, it's up a hill, it's uh, away from the coastline. And, um, and then there sort of arose this new opportunity. So at the same time, they were dealing with a water supply challenge. Uh, Morro Bay gets all of its water from the state water project. And as we know, state water project water is snowpack. Um, it is susceptible to drought. It is susceptible to reduced allocations due to climate change. And of course, the whole infrastructure is susceptible to earthquakes. Um, and so, you know, they have, they do have a backup water. So they have an existing backup water supply. It's a groundwater basin, um, but it's also right on the sea. And so if they over pump that groundwater basin, it will become, you know, it'll, it's very susceptible to seawater intrusion. So they said, okay, look, we already have to completely move our wastewater treatment plant, completely build it from the ground up again. So let's just use this as an opportunity to do a water recycling program. Since we're already rebuilding this plant, let's add potable water reuse. Let's turn this wastewater all the way from wastewater, all the way to drinking water. And then we can use that as a backup water supply um, in case our state water project goes down. And so, the way that that is, you know, that's called, they're doing, they're implementing what's called an indirect potable reuse scheme in the state of California. They're treating the water, they're purifying it all the way to drinking water standards, and then they're injecting it. They actually will be injecting it into their aquifer. Then the water lives in the aquifer for a little bit of time, and then it gets drawn back out along with the native groundwater, and then it gets used for drinking water supply. Um, and this project will be able to, um, you know, they'll be able to meet about 80% of their water demands um, just with the wastewater, the, the potable water reuse alone. Great. Wow, uh, great story. Thank you. Thanks for providing that background. Uh, let, let's talk a little bit about the cost. Of course, that's what I think many people jump to in many of these projects. So what, what, what's the cost and, and how and who is paying for it? 
Yeah, so it's an expensive project. Um, it's about 130, 140 million dollars. Uh, the rate payers will be paying for it. So their rates are going to go up from about 120 a month on average to about um, 190 on average. And uh, that's more expensive than, you know, the state average water and wastewater bill is, is less than that. But it's actually about, the 190 is about comparable to, um, to what, uh, what folks are paying already along the Central Coast. Um, but to a lot of people living in Morabay, this wasn't exactly, you know, this isn't necessarily particularly palatable for their wastewater rates to go up from 120 to 190. Um, from their perspective, you know, maybe from some people's perspective, you know, we already have a perfectly fine wastewater treatment plant. Um, but of course, you know, they needed to expand it and they needed to move it inland. Um, and so I, one of the interesting pieces about this project um, is that, you know, is the financing piece. So they were able to secure a number of, I think, three or four very low interest rate loans through SRF and through WIPIA. Those are very competitive loans. And they were able to get those loans um, primarily, you know, because they actually had this water recycling component. Um, and they wouldn't have been as competitive for those low interest loans without the water recycling component. And so on the one hand, they said, okay, we could build a cheaper wastewater treatment facility that doesn't have a water recycling component and have it funded through, um, through normal loans, or we could have a wastewater treatment facility that does have a water recycling component and it's funded through low interest loans. And they looked at those two options and they said, those are actually about the same for us. And so of course we're gonna go with the more resilient water supply. So that was a way to make this a little bit more palatable for the rate payers. Um, and now, you know, they, they were highly incentivized to have the water recycling piece. And now they've got this great drinking water insurance policy and they've got really resilient water and wastewater uh, infrastructure. So, I mean, I think it's a big win and I think it was definitely incentivized by these low interest uh, loans. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, I think there's two the piece, uh, and I know you and I talked about this earlier, the avoided cost piece, which I know is a hard one to sort of a um, include in the analysis, but then to communicate to people too, of if the facility had been at that same location, the cost that would have been incurred uh, over time. Um, so, so, but it was great to hear about some of the innovations, particularly on the reuse and around the low interest funding. Um, I want to talk, you know, given the theme of, of climate change, talk a little bit about sort of the energy implications um, of the project, uh, if you could speak a little bit to that. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting. So I think there's two ways to sort of think about this. The first way is we're just thinking about um, relocating an existing wastewater treatment facility to a higher inland location. Uh, those are going to be automatic. They're going to have negative energy implications. I mean, right now, most wastewater treatment facilities are built right along the water. They're at the lowest point of the city. And so all of the sewer, you know, can flow by gravity for the most part to the facility. So now if we're going to move this thing three miles out of town and up a hill, um, you know, you have to now pump that wastewater. In Morro Bay's case, they have to pump the wastewater to get to the facility, and then they have to pump the wastewater the other three miles back to the ocean outfall. Um, so there's definitely negative energy implications um, just from that piece, from moving it inland. Um, there's also, they switched uh, biological treatment technologies from the trickling filter to now they have a membrane bioreactor. It's producing a much higher quality effluent um, that's going to be great for their portable reuse and also for uh, there, you know, from discharge to the ocean. Um, but that process uses more energy than a trickling filter. Trickling filter, all you have to do is pump the water to the top of it and uh, just let it trickle down. And so it, it's sort of this passive, um, you know, it gets passive oxygen transfer. Whereas with, you know, typical secondary biological processes or membrane bioreactors, you have to pump the oxygen in. So all that uses a lot of energy. Um, and then, of course, we have the potable water reuse processes. We've got a reverse osmosis, we've got a UVAOP, and finally, we have to pump the water into the groundwater basin. So with all these components combined, the, the, the new facility is projected to use about three times more energy than the current facility. Now, there's another way uh, to look at this. The other way to look at this is from a water supply perspective, so from the drinking water supply perspective. Um, so the exist, you know, so the existing water, I should say, the the existing water um, wastewater treatment facility uses about um, three kilowatt 
kilowatt hours per thousand gallons. And the new facility was about nine kilowatt hours per thousand gallons. And um, uh, my eyes always kind of glaze over when people talk about kilowatts. So, uh, you know, three kilowatt hours per thousand gallons, you use about, um, use about a thousand gallons in California every uh, two to three weeks. And, um, it, you know, in other places you use more, but so it's about three kilowatt hours every two to three weeks per person. And then just for comparison, um, you use about a hundred kilowatt hours to power your uh, refrigerator for about the same amount of time. So you can just sort of compare it to that hundred, hundred kilowatt hours for your refrigerator. And then with every number I talk about, it's, you know, kind of just compare it to that. So three kilowatt hours to nine kilowatt hours for the new, um, for the new facility. Now, tertiary wastewater treatment plant, wastewater treatment alone is typically around two kilowatt hours per thousand gallons. Then when we add advanced treatment for potable reuse and the infrastructure of the wells, we're adding about four to five kilowatt hours per thousand gallons. Um, and, you know, so yes, the whole thing is, is higher than that because there's pumping um, and you add it all together, but you already have to treat the wastewater, right? So just for the advanced water treatment portion alone, it's about four to five. And you can compare that to other water supplies. So importing water from the state water project or from the Colorado River um, to places in, in California is typically around six to 10 kilowatt hours per thousand gallons. Um, and then finally, if we look at ocean, uh, ocean desalination, uh, that's around 10 to 15 kilowatt hours uh, per thousand gallons. So again, if we think about this project purely from the water supply perspective, it's a relatively low energy water source. Great, thank you. Um, and I, just a last question for you in terms of, you know, it's still relatively early in the project. Um, it hasn't yet been completed, but, but what sort of lessons do you think can be drawn from this? Yeah, I think there's a couple of key takeaways. Um, one is that, you know, reminder is that Morro Bay is a very small community um, and they are able to implement this fairly complex potable reuse project. Um, so small communities can do this. Um, they did have a little bit of an advantage. They already have reverse osmosis on their existing groundwater wells. So they have some practice with these more, you know, advanced technologies already. So they have a little bit of a leg up there. But one of the key advantages of, um, of a small community implementing this is that um, there's no interjurisdictional agreements. You go to a big, you know, you go down to LA and you've got somebody running the collection system, somebody totally different running the water treatment plant, somebody different running the, the wastewater treatment plant. In Morro Bay, it's one entity running collection system, wastewater treatment plant, water treatment plant, and distribution system. And it's the same team of operators. I mean, the operators are all trained already on all of those different pieces of the system. And so um, to add this integrated water supply project is, it, it's a little bit more um, managed from a managerial and organizational perspective. It's, it's actually a little bit simpler. Um, and I think the other key takeaway that I was thinking about when um, we were kind of talking about this earlier is that there's just a very important role that the state and federal government, I think, has to play in incentivizing um, these types of forward thinking, resilient infrastructure projects. You know, I'm not sure that the rate payers of Morro Bay would have been raising their hands, begging to pay more money for, uh, for water and wastewater. Uh, but because, you know, they had, they weren't incentivized, um, you know, they're now are gonna have some of the most resilient water along the entire coast. And if, if something does happen, they're gonna be just, you know, having a great time. It's like, hey, come on, you can still come vacation in Morro Bay, you know, maybe you can't go down there because they don't have any more wastewater. But um, so anyway, so I, I think that it's really important to have our, our state and federal governments um, incentivizing these projects. And again, I mean, as Jennifer was saying, you know, more funding um, is, is critical. Great, thank you. Um, and just as a reminder, if you have any questions, please put them in, in the Q&A. Um, I'm gonna switch over and, and talk to Eileen White for a few minutes, but then once we're done with that, we're gonna open it up and, and do some audience questions. So again, please please be thinking about uh, questions for our panelists. So Eileen, uh, you're Director of Wastewater at for East Bay Mud. Um, and East Bay Mud has been a leader in implementing co-digestion. And in 2012, its main wastewater treatment plant uh, became the first in North America to be a net energy producer. 
Um, that plant also generates recycled water, but it's also a low lying facility vulnerable to marine and groundwater flooding as well as other climate impacts. So it sort of brings a lot of the issues we've been talking about, you know, for the last 40 minutes or so sort of together. Um, you know, I was struck in, in doing some reading, you know, I found this great report that you all released in June of uh, 2020. Um, this climate action, or excuse me, climate change plan that focused on the wastewater asset. So, um, so congratulations on that. Um, I'm hoping you can talk a little bit about some of the key district policies and practices that relate to climate change and sort of where this climate change plan fits within those efforts. Great. Well, first, I want to say thank you for having me today. I'm honored to be on this panel with such distinguished speakers. And just for people who may not be familiar with East Bay Municipal Utility Districts or EBMA, we provide water to 1.4 million customers and wastewater service to 740,000 customers. And I began my career in the water sector uh, here at East Bay Mud and ran the water system for 20 years, came to wastewater and then went back and forth. So I'm I represent Recycle. Um, I have been recycled back to wastewater about four years ago. And I want to say that um, East Bay Mud recognizes that climate change is a growing threat to our community. And in fact, our district has adopted a climate action policy that our board approved in June of 2019. And basically, we have a climate change plan and where we've evaluated the vulnerabilities to all our different assets and how can we adapt to climate change and how can we mitigate it and it's really our policy to understand mitigate and um, take that into uh, account when we plan our projects as we go forward and so when we we have our existing infrastructure we make sure we look at what are the impacts of climate change how can we mitigate our greenhouse gas footprint and how do we adapt Great. Um, in your recent assessment, um, what did you find vulnerabilities was, was I think one of the first things it talked about. Um, and what did you find were the key vulnerabilities for the wastewater uh, facilities and operations? Great. So I would say, well, there's, there's rising temperatures that you think, well, of course, rising temperatures impacts the water system. You've got evaporation, less water supply, but that increases water demand. And then there, that increases the electricity demand, which means we may have more rolling blackouts. There may be power shortages. Um, and then with extreme weather, we're going to see critically dry years. And with the critically dry years comes, you know, the potential for uh, more wildfires. So we may see an increase in public safety power shutoffs, which impacts our ability to operate the water and the wastewater system. Um, we're expecting to see increased wastewater flows during storms due to the infiltration and inflow from leaky sewer pipes. And then you've heard a lot about rising sea levels. And with rising sea levels, we're going to see more corrosion and increased wastewater effluent pumping. And then with droughts and droughts from the water system, you have reduced snowpack and also the potential for the fires and public safety power shutoffs, as I mentioned. But there's also water conservation and water conservation is great from a water supply standpoint, but we will see less water flow. So we'll see more concentrated influent coming into our plant, which uh, makes for increased wastewater odors. And then just the timing and quality of the precipitation will increase our wastewater flows during storms, but then during the droughts, we're gonna have less flows coming in. So it's the two extremes. So I'd say those are some of the key vulnerabilities um, impacting wastewater operations. So, so just a few things to think about. That's right. <laughs> Um, so uh, before we get into some of the more adaptation strategies, I mean, obviously one of the things, and I think one of the themes in this are the opportunities for energy recovery or efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions as a way to um, avoid un more unmanageable conditions. You know, it's going to be hard enough, obviously, with the changes we're already uh, seeing. You know, how do, what, what do we need to do to, to avoid kind of worsening climate change? So can, can you speak a little bit to what East Bay Mud is doing in reducing greenhouse gas emissions in, in an effort to sort of reduce the severity of climate impacts? Sure. So we take climate change very seriously. In fact, we've adopted aggressive greenhouse gas reduction goals. And it gives me a chance to kind of explain some of the competing priorities for the wastewater system. So for the water system, the goal is to eliminate direct and indirect greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 completely. 
For the wastewater system, we don't have quite as an aggressive as a goal, and I'll explain that from a wastewater utility perspective. Our goal is to eliminate the indirect greenhouse gas emissions by 2040 and reduce the direct GHGs by 50% over 2000 uh, levels. So what are some of the things we're doing? Well, we produce about 50,000 megawatt hours of renewable energy each year by combusting biogas created through the wastewater treatment process. Um, we're also investing in more efficient, uh, fuel efficient hybrid and plug-in vehicles, which has resulted in a significant reduction in our greenhouse gas reductions. Every passenger vehicle that is in our fleet now is either hybrid or a plug-in vehicle. Um, we've seen reducing water demand through water conservation reduces the greenhouse gas emissions associated with the delivery, treatment, and distribution of recycled water. We're using recycled water to irrigate the landscaping at the wastewater treatment plant. Currently, the district uses has a capacity of about 9 million gallons per day of recycled water with a goal to build that to 20 MGD by 2040. But I wanna take a few minutes to talk about kind of the competing priorities. Um, is, and one of the examples is our, we're really proud of our resource recovery program, um, as you mentioned earlier, where we produce enough electricity now to meet the needs of the wastewater plant. And we sell the excess back to the Port of Oakland to the tune of about $900,000 in revenue a year which is used to offset our customers' wastewater bills. And so with all the changes with SB 1383 and the uh, desire to divert organics from landfill, you'd think, whoa, what an opportunity, which there is an opportunity, you know, to look at diverting that food waste out of landfills. But some of the things we have to be thoughtful about in our evaluation about increasing our program more is to consider the increase in nutrients to San Francisco Bay and the increase in nitrous emissions with future large food waste projects. So it's kind of the competing priorities is that it's good for the entire environment and reducing greenhouse gas footprint to take that food waste out of landfills, bring it to the wastewater plant and generate green renewable electricity. But as we bring that extra food waste, we're increasing nutrients of San Francisco Bay. And one thing we're not proud of, of the 37 POTWs in San Francisco Bay, we're the largest dischargers of nutrients to San Francisco Bay. Now, we are uh, we discharge far out and it's deep, so we have not seen any negative impacts, but we do know San Francisco Bay's a nutrient-enriched estuary. So that's just some of the competing priorities we have to balance as we think about planning for climate change. And as I mentioned, nutrients, we're working collaboratively with um, the Regional Water Quality Control Board with uh, the various environmental groups such as Baykeeper and others and the state board. To, we're spending a lot of money to study the impacts of nutrients, emerging contaminants and climate change to San Francisco Bay. So you have to be careful. There's no free lunch these days. You know, you want to take the food waste, but then there's also the impacts we need to look at to what does it do to the air quality in the West Oakland community. So those are all some of the things we're considering as we move forward and plan for the future. Yeah, and, and it does strike me, um, you know, on the, you raised a point about sort of collaboration and partnerships, and it seems that that's kind of a, a theme that I saw through, through that report um, as a way of addressing some of these issues where we, there may be trade-offs in some areas um, or additional measures needed to, to reduce some of those. So um, I don't know if you want to add any, any sort of detail that that was just something that sort of jumped out to me as, as a strategy for sort of dealing with that. Yeah, so we collaborate with lots of various entities. Uh, I chair the Climate Change and Resilience Committee for the National National Association of Clean Water Agencies. We're very involved with the California Association of Sanitation Agencies. We're involved with AMWA. And I really enjoy the collaborative working relationship we have as part of studying nutrients and emerging contaminants in San Francisco Bay with the state board, the regional board, EPA, the non-governmental environmental associations. We've come together uh, the utilities, you know, the wastewater utilities, along with the regulators and NGOs to say, what's the best thing to do? Let's not just impose new regulations that could cost the ratepayers significant dollars. Let's first understand the science and let's make any new regulations the regulators are going to come out with is going to be based on sound science. So I feel we're very fortunate to be able to collaborate and make sure whatever we do, whether and, and they understand our competing priorities with 
our R2 program where we bring in the trucked waste and as much as we want to grow it, it increases nutrients and it creates uh, additional nitrous oxide that we're emitting into the environment. So it's really nice to collaborate and be able to be transparent and tell the public, tell the regulators, tell the environmental groups, what are the competing priorities and what's our recommended approach to proceed and get their input. Mm -hmm. Great. And a last question for you before, again, before we go to the audience Q&A is just um, in thinking about, you know, what are the types of strategies that, that East Bay Mud is pursuing to sort of adapt to climate impact, impacts, particularly, I think, for the, for the wastewater system? Right. So, you know, we heard um, earlier speaker talk about, you know, the relocating uh, of a wastewater plant. Fortunately, we don't have to do that with East Bay Med uh, at this point, but we are being very cautious. You know, we're, we're dealing with, you know, tough times right now as far as economic and want to keep our ratepayers um, bills down. So we're making sure we're making no regrets investments in our infrastructure. So infrastructure investments now consider the need for sustainability and resilience, and they're designed to adapt to climate change through various measures. Um, and one of the ways we do this is we've adopted and we're following sea level rise design guidelines to determine the appropriate height for electrical equipment to avoid inundation due to sea level rise and storms. So we have a pumping plant located close to the shoreline in Alameda here. And so as we're rehabbing that, we're taking an opportunity to, hey, now's the time to, to raise up the electrical equipment. The other thing we're doing is we're working collaboratively with the various cities that we provide wastewater service to. There's seven different entities. So we're working collaboratively with them to systematically rehab the aging wastewater infrastructure to comprehensively and cost-effectively reduce stormwater inflow and infiltration, which is gonna be exasperated with these more atmospheric rivers and with climate change. And so there's been a lot of progress done over the last several years in rehabbing the aging stormwater system. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we're just working collaboratively with others. I mean, the great thing in California, unlike in um, maybe some other states, that people really take climate change very seriously and that uh, we can partner. And what, another example is our plant is located at the foot of the Bay Bridge. We're fortunate that it's really not gonna be impacted in the next few decades, but that means we need to plan now so that we're ready for the future. And it's a regional problem because you've got the foot of the Bay Bridge, you've got the Caltrans uh, freeways, you've got PG&E infrastructure, you've got the rail lines, you got the Port of Oakland. So now's the time to plan for the future to solve this regional problem. So it's really great just that everyone in, that we work with takes climate change very seriously. Great, thank you so much. So um, I wanna switch now and, and talk to, uh, and, and address some of the audience questions that came in. Um, and so, you know, maybe I'll throw them out there if, if folks wanna jump in. Um, the, the first one, though, maybe I'll direct to, to Chris, although, of course, if others uh, want to jump in on this, is, is a question around um, the potential to divert food waste uh, to land-based uses, like fertilization instead of sort of um, ocean, dis ocean outfalls or such. Do you have any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I was just in the middle of typing a response, but I might as well just say it live. Yeah, a California Senate Bill 1383 proposes both composting of food waste and anaerobic digestion to divert food waste from landfill. And both of these strategies uh, include land application of biosolids, which is a huge thing that uh, not only State Water Board um, is considering, uh, but also CalRecycle, who is kind of the host or uh, watches over the um, Senate Bill 1383, um, also agriculture uh, and, uh, and other entities, regulatory entities that are considering how we can uh, consider biosolids uh, uh, on land. And so that is definitely a consideration. We're working through all of our regulations. Uh, from the state water board side, we're particularly looking at groundwater. We're concerned about things like PFAS, um, and other contaminants. Um, and so we're working through all those regulations, CalRecycle and the State Water Board and Agriculture. They're working on a tool for different um, jurisdictions and, uh, and industries to navigate all these different regulations. Uh, and so we're still trying to catch up with that now. Okay, thank you. 
There was a question uh, that came in actually before uh, before we we started today, um, but one about thinking about, and this is something I've been thinking about myself. You know, how do we ensure sort of these strategies are available to small and medium sized systems? Uh, you know, whether it's reuse or energy recovery. Um, you know, a lot of those we've typically seen them in the larger facilities, the more resourced plants and just wondering um, for, for anyone, anyone can jump in on this kind of thoughts around how we make sure that we aren't leaving the small and medium sized facilities behind in, in implementing these. Who wants to jump in. Maybe Jennifer I'll, I'll go I'll go to you. Okay. Um, um well, I, I would say that there's some very exciting projects now that are happening, um, creative projects that have been recently happening in the Central Valley with agricultural reuse involving cities um, and, um, and ag reuse. So I think there's different types of reuse that can help that, that are that reflect the different types of needs in our community, whether in San Francisco, it's on-site reuse, as you mentioned, the larger, bigger, Potable reuse facilities, a lot of them are bigger and are along the coast, but there's still a huge need for ag reuse in the Central Valley in those smaller communities. And um, I think that that's, that's one place where we see that. Also, I should also say, um, you see a lot of ag reuse um, in the north part of the Bay as well in the, in the vineyards areas. So there's a couple things that come to mind. Great, thank you. Anyone else wanna jump in on that? Maybe Chris, if you want to speak to sort of on the energy recovery side um, and, and the co-digestion side, obviously more specifically thinking about that, what, what, what are you seeing in respect to the small and medium size? Yeah, like, as I mentioned before, um, the small and medium size uh, facilities, uh, they have a bit of a tougher time in terms of um, uh, they're recovering from investments. Um, and so because, uh, you know, because of scale, uh, larger um, agencies tend to be able to recover from the capital costs uh, a little bit more, uh, a little bit more. And so each small to medium sized uh, facility would need to really consider uh, how much food waste that they're incorporating especially in terms of co-digestion. Um, though we do overall see kind of biogas use and electricity generation a little bit more of, uh, 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 in terms of a GHG reduction benefit and an investments benefit um, for those versus compost, but it really depends on the individual facility. Great. Well, we're now at the end of the hour. I want to take this opportunity to thank all of my panelists today um, for, for joining in this discussion. And also, again, to thank Alec and Rebecca for helping organize. 